Professor Ebden. Um, welcome to Manchester University. I wonder okay. if you could tell us how your job as Director of the Office of Fair Access has changed since you were appointed in August 2012. Well, uh, I think one of the biggest changes is uh, visits like this. Um, I'm very keen to get out and about and to mm -hmm. see universities and hear what they're doing to promote widening participation and, and fair access. Uh, uh, and it's also good therapy for me after 40 odd years with students. I, I rather miss that day-to-day -day contact with people and with students. Uh, so that's, uh, that's changed. Um, I said when I came in that it will be a period of uh, greater challenge to, to, to universities, challenging them to do more to, um, uh, to promote fair access, but also greater support, helping them uh, with the challenges um, uh, that they face. I said I wanted to see students more involved, um, so greater engagement of students. Um, I said also that I wanted to see um, equalities uh, issues um, uh, uh, more strongly um, uh, feature in uh, widening participation, uh, and I think we've uh, we've been able to do that as as well. So um, those have been the, the the major changes that I've sought to bring about. Okay. So overall, you think the sectors responded quite well to these challenges that you outlined. I'm very pleased with the response of the sector. It has exceeded my expectations. Uh, 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 if the UCAS figures for acceptances um, uh, translate into admissions, and, uh, and of course we don't know that yet until the Higher Education Statistics Agency produces its, uh, its data, which is always a couple of years behind uh, the, the uh, universities and colleges admission uh, system uh, data. But, uh, uh, but uh, it looks as though from that UCAS data, as if we will have moved significantly, even in the most selective uh, uh, universities, towards uh, widening participation. It used to be that you were seven and a half times more likely to be in a highly selective university if you came from the most advantaged 20% of the population than if you came from the most disadvantaged 20%. That figure seems to have shifted to closer to 5.7, 5.9 uh, in the uh, a couple of years that I've been doing the job and so that's certainly a move in the right direction. Yeah, and how do you attribute the success of, well, what do you attribute that move in the right direction to? What do you think are the key initiatives? Is it more, for example, about outreach activity? Is it the bursary system that we have in place? Well, I'd love to claim it was me, but I think uh, uh, given that uh, our research suggests that it is long-term, sustained and targeted outreach that's effective, okay. uh, what universities are saying is the work that we've been doing over a number of years now is really beginning to pay off and, uh, and is uh, coming through strongly. And what does really good outreach look like when you go around to all these universities and you see the different practices and different models? What do you think is most effective in terms of for every pound spent getting a student from a disadvantaged background into university? Which offers the best value for money? Well, I think that the best is the one that people really believe in and really um, uh, put uh, activity in action in. You all know uh, that's always so in education, isn't it? If you're enthusiastic about something, uh, then it works. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that um, it needs to be long term. You can't just go in on one occasion and, and think that's going to make a difference. It needs to be uh, sustained, um, a series of interventions that are age appropriate and, and to develop onwards. Mm -hmm. I think it needs to engage not just the student, but the family as well. So often universities mm -hmm. go in and say we've got a really enthusiastic response, uh, but then they went home and the parents said no, university's not for the likes of us uh, and, uh, and we felt we'd wasted our so You've got to engage parents. But, uh, you certainly need the cooperation and partnership of, of, of schools and colleges um, uh, in, in the work uh, that, uh, that you do. And also I do find that uh, where students are engaged, uh, the student ambassadors or, or whatever, when students are engaged in outreach work, then it's very often much more effective, particularly students from that kind of background. Because all the time you're trying to give the message, yes, the university is for people like me. Yeah. Do you think that kind of deep-seated distrust of higher education that you do find in some, um, in some groups, do you think that's beginning to be broken down? Uh, yes, I do think so. Do you think um, there's a cultural shift? Um, I think there's obviously, uh, I mean it's changed, I mean I think uh, 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 the, the fee system and the, and, the, and the size of the fee now um, is making people think very seriously about education as an investment. Yeah. Um, now as an educationalist, um, uh, you and I will have um, uh, mixed views about that. Um, it's good that people are taking their education seriously, but it isn't just about getting a good career, but of course higher education does uh, and is the best investment you can make to get a good career. Mm -hmm. What do you think then that the, the increase in fees um, hasn't resulted in a drop 
in um, applications from students from disadvantaged backgrounds. Do you think that means the, the evidence and rhetoric which suggested that such students were more debt averse has been proven false, or do you think it's to do with other factors, such as the economy, and how should universities move forward in terms of a higher fees environment, in terms of making sure we continue to attract students from all backgrounds? Well, what we've uh, certainly learned is that we have to communicate this new system. It's actually a very complex sy system to, to communicate to people, um, uh, and we know uh, that we're able to get this message across to 18-year-olds because we can get lots of them together in the school and the college. We're having much more difficulty getting the message through to mature students uh, and to part-timers where you have to take their message one by one. But the message has to be uh, that um, there are no upfront fees. You only start to repay them when you're earning above £21,000 a year and only at 9% of salary. We've got to get all of those points into those groups of students because all of those are potential um, uh, reasons why people uh, will shy away from, uh, from higher education. So, Getting the message across has, I think, been key to our success here. So you mentioned mature students and you mentioned part-time students, and they're obviously key groups for you because you're interested in widening participation. Do you, do, you think there are, do you think there's more that can be done? You talk about information, advice and guidance. Do you ever think the structure itself is maybe a problem for students like that? For example, if you're a mature student, would you be more reluctant to take on large amounts of debt at a later stage in life? Well, I think there's some evidence, and, and I do hear it as I go around the country, but if you've already got a significant debt, like a mortgage, yeah. uh, then another debt um, is a problem. I've met students who've said to me, uh, potential students who've said to me, uh, look, um, I've only just paid off my credit card debt from yeah. uh, this or that life event, um, and I don't really want another debt. Um, mm. uh, and so it needs to be carefully explained. It's not like a credit card debt. Um, people who've had experience of debt um, are more reluctant, and, uh, and, and we need to communicate those basic messages to them. Okay. Do you think there's been a shift in your time as Director of Offer in terms of who underrepresented groups are? So I'm thinking particularly of changes, for example, in the gender imbalance at universities. Would you say, for example, treat male students, or is there any possibility that they could be treated as an underrepresented group, particularly maybe those from certain backgrounds? Well, I think, um, uh, uh, yes, the, the picture is, is, is changing all the time. Um, uh, what we have seen is a remarkable success uh, with most uh, minority ethnic groups. Um, there are now very few of those groups which are underrepresented in our universities. I mean, um, uh, African Caribbean males and Bangladeshi origin women are, are two examples where they're still underrepresented, but, but by and large, those groups are overrepresented. Uh, but as you say, we are beginning to get increasingly worried about what the minister likes to call. Um, working class boys uh, and, uh, and that, uh, they are a group which are underrepresented. Um, they're a group who underperform in education as you will know uh, in school uh, we get worried about their performance there and their achievement in school uh, and uh, that plays through into, into university where they are increasingly underrepresented and that's got to be a very real concern for us in this country because we know that so many of the jobs in future are going to be for graduates uh, and if uh, that group of boys um, are not taking education seriously, and then we are building up quite a significant social problem for us uh, in this country. What do you think the dangers are for um, widening participation progress? So there's been this great progress in the last 10 years. What do you think could possibly put the brakes on that progress? Um, well, <laughs> um, I, I, th I think that um, we uh, I'd, I'd like to reframe that question around the other way. What do we need to carry on doing to maintain the progress that, that we're making? I think it is sustaining this outreach work. Um, and of course it is expensive. Uh, and of course I am concerned uh, that um, uh, as um, uh, government finances become tighter and tighter, uh, that um, uh, people begin to take money away from that outreach work and spend it on immediate um, uh, initiatives. Uh, and there's always a danger of pulling away from long-term things which are effective and investing it in, in uh, short-term uh, activity and, and, and firefighting. So I think we've got to sustain that long-term work. So if you ask them what the biggest threat is, I think the threat is we stop thinking long-term about this as a problem. We forget that kids form decisions about going to university, maybe as young as primary school, and that's where we need to be working. And that's pretty long term. And it takes a brave government and a brave university to say, yes, we're in it for that longer period. Mm -hmm.
So you think the instability in the funding model that might be used in the future could potentially act as a deterrent to young people today? Well, this is a real challenge to the Student Opportunity Fund. We have to carry on making the case to government um, uh, and universities have got to make the case of how they're using that Student Opportunity Fund uh, to um, promote outreach and student success and how it is a long-term uh, important investment that's being made and point out um, uh, to, to politicians uh, the impact that that expenditure is, is having, coupled with, of course, the increasingly large amount of expenditure that the universities are making out of their own access agreement funding. Professor Epton, thank you very much. Okay.